Hello, everybody. Welcome to the last podcast in the series of Ecclesiastes. This is going to be on part of chapter 11 and chapter 12, and it's going to give you the conclusion of the entire book. Uh, I've decided to call this lesson Value in Vanity, because the whole book of Ecclesiastes has basically covered what the curse is like, how vanity is seen within all facets of life. And in his conclusion, he's going to tell you that even though there is vanity, there's actually a reason for the vanity, which makes the vanity not vain. All right. Now, all throughout the book, you also find that he said you won't see the value in it if you don't have faith in God, because God is the one who gives value to it. All right. And ultimately, that means we just see the truth behind what is going on around us. If you don't see the truth in what's going on around you, you'll just be confused, and uh, that'll lead to uh, unsatisfaction, and and it will ultimately lead to despair and death. All right, so he starts out by exhorting young men in particular, to start trusting God early in their lives. Now, I'm going to put a picture up here on the screen again, like I did in my last podcast. We're going to, uh, it's only just going to be this one picture, though. I'm not going to do like a slideshow or anything. I want you to see on this picture how Solomon likens one day as to the lifetime of a man. So the sunrise would be your birth. And then as the day goes on, what do we do? Like, think of a a day in your life. Whenever the sun rises, you wake up, and what is there to do? There's work to do. So you use the uh, the time when you've your energy has been restored through sleep. You use that the next day to work. Now, as you work, what begins to happen? You start to lose that energy because you're expending it. Okay, so the picture is. As the sun goes down, you start losing your energy. And what happens at the end of the day? Well, you're tired, you're worn down, and you go, you lay down and go to sleep. All right, so Solomon is likening uh, that to your life. So as the day progresses, your body starts to wear out. So as the days and years go by, uh, you start noticing blemishes. On your body, you start noticing aches and pains. All right, that is the expenditure of your lifetime, the opportunity that you have to serve God uh, vanishing away. All right, and as you grow into your old age, uh, these are called the dark days. You start losing things like your parents, possibly children. You start losing pets, you start losing mobility, ability to live life to the fullest, it just starts ebbing away. All right. And so whenever Solomon mentions uh, morning, evening, um, dark days, he's referring to something like this. And the reason you know this is because later on in the chapter, he starts talking about how the he starts exhorting young men to uh, have faith while they're young, and then He also mentions before the old age comes, and you'll see that as we go. All right, so let's get started in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 6. All right, so it says, In the morning sow your seed, and and in the evening do not withhold your hand. So he's basically exhorting everyone to sow seed all day long. So if you were looking at this as your lifetime, the seed would be God's word. Because remember, that's what uh, the purpose of Israel and the church who's been engrafted into Israel, uh, that is their job, to uh, reveal God to the rest of the world, to be a blessing to the rest of the world. So that's what he's referring to there. He's uh, to sow at all times, purpose in your heart, uh, to do this daily, all right? Because that's what faith is. You believe that uh, whatever thing God says is true, 
So in faith, you're, you're, as you go throughout your life, you're giving bread to other people, spiritual bread, that is, and physical, and uh, things of that nature. It says, for you do not know which will prosper, <clears throat> either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Now, what this is talking about is we can't see other men's hearts. So he's saying um, that's kind of the growth is up to God. That's, that's not in your purview. So what you need to do is just obey God's commands. All right. Which, like I said, is is done in faith. And it's 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 a farming metaphor. If you think about farming, um, if you plant gardens, you know that not every seed you put out is going to come up. All right, so he's he's using that metaphor here. A farmer always sows in hope. All right, and also if you want to think of it this way, the reason he's encouraging people to do this when they're vigorous and young is because you only get one opportunity, one lifetime to serve the Lord. And if you can think of it as a 401k, all right? He says that you'll have treasures in heaven when you do these things. Well, if you start young, uh, which I was told to do whenever I started actually working in the world, they were like, hey, if you start putting back when you're 18, and it can be a tiny amount, like you could put $50 back a month. And he said, you would be a millionaire by the time you get to be 60. <clears throat> And it kind of works that same way with uh, sowing God's word. It's compounded over time. It works like compound interest. Now, I worked at a shipyard where I've seen old guys say that, give the same advice, but they didn't do that when they were younger. They actually realized at age like 50 something that, oh, I haven't been putting back. I'm not going to be able to retire so they just start shoveling everything they can into this into their account, their 401k account, and there was just no way they could put enough in there to make it match what would have happened over an entire lifetime of compound interest. And that it like I said it works the same with uh sowing God's word because if you plant uh, in people's hearts for a long period, those people that you reached are also going to reach other people. And it compounds that way, okay? So much more reward if you start young, and that's what Solomon is encouraging people to do. All right, so a parallel passage that we can speak about that's found in the New Testament that uh, is basically saying the same things that Ecclesiastes says here is found in James chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. It says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So it's. let me just point out where it kind of parallels there. It says, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. It's the same as Solomon saying, uh, so everywhere you go because you don't know what's going to be profitable just as it said here. And then he said, and then he said, so in the morning and evening, and he'll go on to, he'll go on to be more specific about saying your life is like a vapor. But then James says it as well. He says, your life is like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. So that shows your trust in what the Lord has for you. So it's more like you, um, we don't really know the way the Holy Spirit is going to be leading. However, if we, if we just obey the commission, which is from the Holy Spirit, um, we'll be doing well. And, that, and then he comes down here to say, if we know to do good, uh, we should do it. And if we don't, it's sin. That's, basically saying to 
And then down here when it says, therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin, we know people need the message we have. So go and sow every opportunity you get. And I know you'll be scared. I mean, I'm scared to do this too. But if we just walk with God, I promise you, he's not going to overwhelm you and say, look, you need to be like Billy Graham right now. No, just start small. Uh, just do a little bit every day. If you just uh, catch one person a day and you start when you're young, uh, that'll compound over time. All right, it doesn't have to be anything crazy. Um, just uh, step out in faith, and I guarantee you, he'll he'll make it to where it's enjoyable to you, and you'll want to do it all the time. Now, like I said, I'm not quite there yet, but I am try, trying to do uh, what God has called me to do uh, through prayer. I always pray for boldness, and I believe he'll bring it in time. So a little side note on this passage, let me point out right here, uh, in James chapter 4, the very first verse where he says, this man says, tomorrow I'll go here, spend a year there, and make a profit. Then it says, you don't, you, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So let me just point this other thing out. That if you hear a man claiming to know what God is doing, like exactly what he's doing, and it's not based on any of God's promises in his word, I would be very leery of that person. All right, this is the this is kind of like a red flag, a mark of false teachers. They'll say God is doing this, God is doing that when it's not found in his word. Um I'm not saying that they're incorrect, but at the same time they're claiming to know God's mind and uh to an extent we are to know his mind. So just be careful. Some people make uh, claims that aren't true about God. Um, we've just got to be very studious in the word to kind of avoid those things. All right, so to the young people who are trying to follow God, uh, just some quick advice. Don't follow the flesh. Don't worry about the things God tells you don't not to worry about, like your clothes, your food, things that the the people in the world who don't, trust God are worried about. Because when you do that as a Christian, you're building your house with straw, hay, and stubble. But if you put your, uh, if you consider God daily and remember him, he'll bring to you what you should be doing to store treasures in heaven. All right, so don't walk by the flesh, walk by the spirit. All right, so let's continue on to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 7. All right, so with that picture in mind, I've got it on the screen. It says, Truly the light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. So this is referring to the first half of the day, when you're young and vigorous, when you're full of energy, and you haven't uh, been, you're not decrepit, you know. Then it goes on to say in verse 8, But if a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, this is speaking of a man who's been walking with God from his youth, it says, Yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. All right, so now this is the, the other half of the photo. And he's talking to young men here. He's saying, Remember that there will be days of darkness. They're guaranteed to every person. He's not... He's not going to get out of it because he's still a man. That was just part of the curse that was placed on the world, all right? So we need to expect times of perishing and loss because they are on the horizon for, er for everyone who walks on the earth. And these points that he's reiterating here, he's made in other parts of this book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 says, Consider the work of God. For who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider. Surely God has appointed the one as well as the other, so that man can find out nothing that will come after him. All right, so that's that same idea right here. It says, all that is coming is vanity. 
All right, so like I said, he's speaking to the youth. He's talking about the old age that's coming is vanity. Now, what does he mean by this? He's saying don't be discouraged by all that is coming because everybody's going to face this. And later he draws that parallel uh, that youth is vanity also. And what he's saying there is the youth kind of feel like they're going to be young forever. And it's, it's, it's almost like, well, why should I follow God? I'm feeling good. I don't really need anything at the moment. When you become old and decrepit, you start realizing, oh, I do need God because I can't retain my own spirit. It's going to have to be given up one day. He's basically saying, don't look at your circumstances and base God's approval of you on that because it's vanity. Does that make sense? I hope I'm making sense there. So he goes on to say, Rejoice, O man, in your youth, and let the, your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. All right, so this also indicates that in his conclusion, Solomon saw clearly that there was a place in youth for legitimate pleasures and satisfactions of life. If the meaning of life was not found in the pursuit of pleasure, just as it said in the beginning of Ecclesiastes, it's also not found in self-denial for its own sake. Because remember, as Christians, we are taught to deny self. All right, but what if you do it when? Uh, what if you do it without faith in God? Like, for instance, a good example of this is Shaolin monks. Their whole religion is about self-denial. However, they're not trusting in Christ, and we know that Christ is the only one who can satisfy your soul. So if you uh, make life all about self-denial, that is the exact same as making it all about pleasure. See, now this is where uh, I don't want people to think that pleasures are bad and uh, riches are bad. It's, It's all made okay if you have faith. I hope that's making sense. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, then you can enjoy everything that you have been given, such as pleasures, and enjoy it as a gift from God. If we accept the truth of the next few lines that there is more to life than what we can see, that there is an eternity and an eternal God to reckon with, then the pleasures of life uh, become enjoyable in the best sense. One doesn't try to find meaning in those pleasures, but simply some good seasoning for, for life that finds its meaning in the eternity and eternal God. So in this frame of mind, we can now turn to the delights of life, not as if they were drugs to kind of tranquilize us, knock us out to kind of, you know, forget about our troubles, but as invigorating gifts from God. So now we're going to look at the next part. All right. So he just said, he's talking to the youth, walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. Now, what exactly is he saying here? He's saying, remember your creator. So as you walk day by day, know that God sees what you're doing. And he, it, he's basically telling him not to forget God. Walk in godly wisdom while you're in the most robust, energetic, and profitable years of your life. And you won't regret it. So here the preacher comes to answer, uh, comes to the answer of his own premise. One may live according to the heart and by what they see, but they should not think that their own heart or eyes will be their judge. 
There is a God in heaven who will bring all your life and your works into judgment. So he goes on to say in verse 10, Therefore, remove from your heart. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. Now, you notice, remember, he said all that is coming is vanity uh, a little further up. And now he's saying childhood and youth are vanity. So that goes to kind of prove my point that I was making earlier, that both childhood and old age don't uh, show you how God feels uh, about how you stand before him, if, if that's making sense. That's not what it should be based on. Circumstance shouldn't be what you base uh, your relationship with God on. Strength or lack of it tells you nothing about a man's character or heart. That's what it means when it says vanity. All right, let's jump back to the beginning of verse 10 real quick. Just to, I'm going to point something out. It says, remove sorrow from your heart. Now, this is done by putting faith in Jesus Christ. Christ is the one who, who removes sorrow from your heart because at that point, you know you've been reconciled to your Creator, and you can uh, rest in that. All right, and that will bring you great joy and satisfaction. Then he says, and put away evil from your flesh. Now, I'm going to jump back in the book of Ecclesiastes because he's made this exact same point before in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 7. He says, Go, eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already accepted your works. Let your garments always be white. Okay, that is what that means. It means to put away evil from your flesh. Cast off the evil works, because you've been saved unto good works. And we know they will all be accepted if you're standing on the foundation of Christ. So that is the end of chapter 11, and we're about to jump into chapter 12. But before we do, I want to read another parallel passage from the New Testament that basically repeats the same idea Solomon was giving there, more, and it's stated more clearly. All right, this is going to be Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 21. It says, see that you walk circumspectly. That means walk carefully. The way in which you conduct your life needs to, needs to be considered uh, very, very meticulously. And then it says, not as fools, but as wise. So that is walking and believing God about how to properly build your spiritual house. And it says in verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. All right, and this is basically saying that opportunity to serve is fleeting because the days are evil. So do so walk circumspectly to redeem the time. And then in verse 17, it says, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the Lord of the... I'm sorry, but understand what the will of the Lord is. That's the key to being wise. Unwise people don't do what I, what this verse just said. Understand what the what the will of the Lord is. And how do we know what the will of the Lord is? Read. Read your Bibles. And then in verse 18, it says, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation. That word dissipation means to waste or squander your time. All right, and that would be sowing. Uh, and look, Time that is given to you by God is a resource, and he's entrusting it to you. And we know that with that time, we should be sowing, sowing seed that God has given us. All right, and those are the things that aren't going to perish. And what does he mean by drunk with wine? He's saying, do not be drunk with wine because it'll cause you to waste your time. Well, anytime the Bible refers to drinking wine or being drunk in a spiritual sense, it's, it means chasing after things that are going to give you pleasure. Uh, basically, you're dedicating your life to please your own flesh. And he's saying this 
has no spiritual value whatsoever. And you're, it's just uh, a waste of the resource of time God has given you. All right. But then it says, be filled with the spirit. All right. Then it's going to qualify what that means and what time well spent means. If you're in the spirit, you're spending your time well, okay? But now it's about to describe it in verse 19. It says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. All right, so we saw speaking psalms, spiritual songs, singing melody. To do those things, you have to know Scripture, and you have to know uh, the things God has revealed to us that is supposed to bring us salvation. And you're supposed to do this in thanksgiving. So that means you, when your heart has been transformed, you will actually be thankful for the gift and want to spread it. All right, and that's that kind of plays into love and all that, how we're supposed to do everything in love. And then it says submitting to one another in the fear of God. So in other words, spend your time raining God's word upon his people and serving one another. Because that will build up everybody and that will save everybody. And that is showing love to the world and the body of Christ. So that was the in-depth description of Remember your Creator, which is what chapter 12 in Ecclesiastes starts off with. All right, so let's read that. Chapter 12, verse 1, it says, and remember, he's still talking to the youth. He says, remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come, and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Okay, so what is he talking about? He's talking about growing old. That's the difficult days, all right? That's when your faith will be tested, all right? And in the next section here, Solomon is going to be giving us a poetic description of growing old. Now, this little section right here, I, I honestly, I couldn't understand it when I read it the first time. I kind of knew where Solomon was going with it. He's talking about death throughout the entire book of Ecclesiastes. He's like, learn to number your days. Remember you're going to die. And <laughs> that is the key to fearing the Lord and actually getting serious about your spiritual life. That's the key to it. Um, so he's, he's trying to, you know, really push that point. Now, right here, I thought it was talking about death, and I was close, but it's actually speaking about growing old. And the reason I know this is because I had to consult a commentary, and I thought it was a, a pretty good commentary. Um, so let's go through it, starting in verse 2. It says, While the sun and the light, the moon and the stars, are not darkened, which means basically say, saying you're not dead yet. You're still alive. You can still see. Uh, it says, and the clouds do not return after the rain. Okay, so now he's kind of given us a picture of something different. Remember, this is a poetic thing. So you kind of have to really think about it to get the meaning. But it, we're likened unto plants, in uh, many scriptures, there's one that says that we are like the grass of the field, that we, we spring up for a moment and then we wither away. All right, so what causes that plant to spring up? It's water. It gives the plant life, right? All right, so he's saying that the clouds do not return after the rain. What happens when a plant doesn't get water? Well, it starts to wilt, wither away, and die. So... It's just a poetic way of saying that you're at you're nearing the end of your life. You're not going to get any more rain. All right, then it goes on to say, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble. And what the commentary said this meant was the arms and the hands and everything that keeps the body is now beginning to shake involuntarily. 
That's basically what that's talking about. The keepers of the house tremble. Then it says, and the strong men bow down. All right, so this is, just means that you're losing vigor. Uh, the legs and the knees begin to sag, and you're, you begin to become hunched over, needing possibly like something to assist you in walking. And then it says, when the grinders cease because they are few. So think about the human body. What is a part of your body that loses, uh, loses thing? It like, well, I'll just go ahead and tell you what it is. Basically, talking about your teeth that grind up your food. He says they they begin to cease because they are few. So teeth are lost, and chewing is more difficult. Then it says, and those that look through the windows grow dim. So what part of the body could this be speaking of? Well, it's speaking of your eyes, because your eyes are the windows of your soul. That's where we look out of. All right, and it it said that they were becoming dim, so they're they're losing their ability. Then it says in verse 4, when the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low. So that basically means that the ears are becoming weaker and weaker. You're losing the ability to hear. When one rises up at the sound of a bird, and that just means that sleep becomes more difficult and one is easily uh, woken up. Then it says, and all the daughters of music are brought low. That basically means that singing and things that used to give you enjoyment, uh, such as like television programs, things of that nature, um, um, all the things that you used to bring you a lot of joy kind of lose their luster. And I can kind of attest to this. When I was younger, it was you could be easily entertained. But as and then, you know, as you grow into teenage years, you seek the adrenaline rush. Well, whenever you get older, you actually start to become less interested in in those things. And that's what it means right there about the daughters of music are brought low. Then it says, also, they are afraid of height and terrors in the way. And this is something that happens to you also as you age and mature. When you're younger, um, you're more daring. Uh, You do stupider things. Dangerous things is what I'm talking about. Things that could hurt you real bad. But as you grow older, you become concerned about those things because you've got a family to feed uh, and you don't want them to get hurt. So your safety awareness kind of increases. That's what that's talking about. In the next part of this, verse 5, it says, When the almond tree blossoms... And if you've ever seen an almond tree, I doubt you have if you're in the south or oh, I don't even know where these things are grown, to be honest. But I did look up a picture online. When they blossom, they're full of white buds. So what do you think that's talking about when, it, when we're relating to the human body and it growing old? Well, their hair. And I thought that when I looked at the picture, I thought that was a good poetic choice because <laughs> that's what it actually made you think of when you looked at it. Then it says the grasshopper is a burden and desire fails. Now, this could be referring to um, just losing energy in general, or this could be talking about it's a, it, when you grow older, you become less able to keep up with the younger people or the, your children. All right, your children are balls of energy, and you've just <laughs> you've spent most of it already, so you can't really keep up with them as good. <clears throat> you ever hear the Chinese people say uh, when they're you know in those martial art movies they say young grasshopper? Yeah, that's kind of what that's kind of an idiom for is uh, little tykes full of energy. All right, <laughs> then it says desire fails. That just means that passions and desires of life begin to weaken and wane. All right, so this last part. Uh, It says, for man goes to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. So here's some parallelism here. He's comparing two different 
uh, walks of life. One man is on the threshold of eternity. And then the other uh, goes about the streets, kind of goes back into his daily life. So that would be the mourners, the one that's at the funeral. All right. Which is more significant? Well, it would be the one who's dying. That is the sojourner that is at the end of his destination, and he's about to step into what life is really about. All right, so that is extremely significant, and that's why Christians at funerals, it really should be a celebration, but I understand it's, it's still sad you miss the person. But at the same time, that, that's the best thing that could have ever happened to a Christian is death. Because you're with your creator, you are fully re- uh, regenerated as far as your body goes. No more aches, no more pains, no more sorrows. And it is just intense joy for them. All right, so in reality, it, it's it's a celebration. Um, however, like I said, I understand that uh, we'll miss the person. So it's a sad occasion in that sense. All right, so I just wanted to point out that that is the man who goes to his eternal home and the mourners who go about the streets, the man who is dying, that is much more significant than uh, continuing in this world. All right, so I want to jump back up to verse 1 in chapter 12. I'm going to read it again because there's parallelism here as well. All right, so... It says, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. And then he goes on to give us that poem about growing old. Then we jump back down to where we were in verse 6. He says the same exact thing again, but now he's talking about in your old age, remember your creator. So in verse 6, he says, remember your creator. And the, uh, I'll tell you why he, he I know this is talking about old age, because in this section, he's talking about your last minutes of life. So in the section where he talks about growing old, he's talking about your last section of life. But now he's narrowing it down to remember your creator in the last moments of your life. So this is when you're already old and you're about to pass. Okay. Verse 6, remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed. That's basically just indicating the value of life and that it will one day slip away. And it's very close for this uh, particular man. So he says, remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken. So a bowl is a vessel, and it's kind of representing the golden opportunity that you have been given to serve, to serve the Lord that will one day shatter, and it won't be recovered. Then he says, or the pitcher that is shattered at the fountain. All right, and that kind of goes to say the same thing. You have an opportunity to be either a useful or a useless vessel. It's one or the other, and uh, that's why he's making all these points to remember your creator in your youth and in the morning, in the evening, sow your seed, because the opportunity is one. It's only one opportunity. Then he says, or the wheel broken at the well. Now, what is the, the, the wheel used for on the well? Well, that's what they stick the little rope in. It's basically a pulley that they tie the bucket to and they go and draw out the water and pull it out. We've been given one opportunity to draw out counsel from the well of your heart. Use it to seek the Lord. All right, and the reason I say that is because in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 5, it says the counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. So that's where I get that from. All right. We have an opportunity to wrestle with God and our own hearts. Because in the end, that's what your heart needs to make a connection with God 
so that he may teach you how to overcome death. All right, then he says in verse 7, The dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. So his main point here is, remember your Creator before you die. (laughs) But he says it much, much better than I could ever say it. Then in verse 8 he says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. Now if you notice, we're in the last chapter of the book. This is coming to Solomon's conclusions. And at the crescendo uh, of this book, he repeats the line that he said in the very first verse of the entire book. So if you go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, he says the exact same thing. He says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So he's repeating that same idea here. Okay, so now he's going to get into the ultimate conclusion of everything. (laughs) So let's begin in verse 9. He says, And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. And this is where they get the idea that Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. And then they, they probably got other things that prove he wrote the book, but that's one of them. Then it says, the preacher sought to find acceptable words. And then it says, and what was written was upright, words of truth. Now, this part where it says the preacher sought to find acceptable words, this kind of gives us the idea that it's not the wisdom isn't coming from Solomon himself. It's coming from another source. All right, and we know that God is the one who gives wisdom. So, and when he says he sought to find acceptable words, these are not flattering words or deceitful, affirming words. He's not affirming anybody. You ever read the Proverbs, his Proverbs are very pointed and correction-oriented. It's meant to correct you in your faulty thinking. All right, so that's what that means by acceptable words. Uh, And, of course, they would be words of truth. Then he says, The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. Now, as I've said before, goads are are long, pointy sticks that they use to poke cattle or sheep to get them to go in a certain direction. All right, and that's exactly what these wisdom books do. They get you to go in a certain direction. All right, then he says that the words of scholars are like well-driven nails. They're pointed sayings that should spur and stick in your memory. So picture a guy hammering something. Uh, It takes a couple of swings to get the nail to drive in deep and stick. All right, so that is why oftentimes Solomon repeats and repeats the same ideas in different ways. He's swinging away at the nail, you know, trying to get it to stick. And that's why he says that. Now, it goes on to say the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. All right, this is the idea that one uh, wisdom only comes from one place. And it's, he describes the person as a shepherd. And who is the shepherd? Jesus Christ. He's our shepherd, the Lord. He leads us, he leads us beside still waters and uh, leads us to green pastures. Then he goes on in verse 12. He says, And further, my son, be admonished by these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. So these pointed sayings, he's saying, be admonished by these, my son. So he's speaking to a younger man, and he's he's basically saying, let these things, these things that I'm telling you, change your mind and guide your heart. Just like the goads. All right. And then uh, when he says here that much study is wearisome to the flesh, he's referring to all, all the different ideas the world has to offer you. So here's the thing about truth. 
How many truths can there be? One. You either took the cookie from the can, uh, cookie from the cookie jar, or you didn't. All right. But how many lies can there be? Multiple. You can make up all kinds of stuff to try to get out of anything. All right. Oh, that's a big difference. And that's kind of the same idea here that if you go and study every little thing, you're going to get all kinds of different answers to different questions. But ultimately, it's just man's opinions because truth cannot be found within man. All right. And that's that is the truth. Um, only God is truth. He is truth itself. So a good example of this would be some health trends. You remember how they were telling everybody that fat was bad, but now they're all saying that fat's good and eggs have too much cholesterol. And then you hear somebody else say, well, eggs actually improve your think, uh, improve your mind or whatever. You got all kinds of different things, but who who knows the truth well the one who made the eggs the one who made the human body and how they relate to each other so i'm not saying um i'm not saying that you should seek out uh your diet (laughs) needs in the bible you might could but what i'm ultimately saying is that the truth of all things uh needs to be sought out in the creator not what man says about things because uh i with the health trends i find my wife and me exhausting ourselves with that we we actually do become exhausted so i i saw i I understood what solomon was saying there and here's one more thought on truth truth is not subjective it's objective And what I mean by that is truth comes from the outside of you, not the inside. So you don't look inward to find truth. You look outside of you. You look at reality. Reality is what tells you what truth is, not what you think about reality or not what you wish about reality. And a good example is... um, Whenever God says he's one way and he says he's unchanging, we shouldn't say, well, I feel like um, God is okay with lying because that's what I want him to be. Just because you want him to be that way doesn't make him that way. You see what I'm saying? God is outside of you. He's not in your mind. If If God was in your mind and you could form him or whatever yeah i guess you could do that but the the truth is reality and god are outside of your mind or your control so you don't get to decide those things all right and that's a huge problem in today's society because people tend to think that god is like that that they're like how they think in their head But what you actually need to do is read the scriptures to find out who God is. That's ultimately what I was getting at with that. All right, so verse 13, it says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing whether good or evil. So that's man's entire duty. It's to uh, seek out God, to seek him and love him and his goodness. Because literally every moment of your life will be laid bare when you stand before him as he's in his judgment seat. All right, now we're going to cover a little bit about what all this means in the grand scheme of him saying all is vanity. So if all was vanity, Solomon would not be admonishing us to do certain things. And what was he admonishing us to do? He was admonishing us to consider our creator, remember him, don't forget him, and to uh, sow seed, which is what God has commanded us to do um, 
if we're to represent him on the earth. So all this comes about by actually believing in God. It comes about by faith. So apart from faith, apart from believing in God, um, you will be living vanity because you'll be chasing after your flesh, which in the, in the end results in nothing of value. So God actually informs us at every moment what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. And God actually infuses meaning into every minute of our lives. But when God is forgotten, the truth of our purpose goes with it. And man must then invent his own purpose, attempting to draw truth from inside of him. And this will lead him to an empty box. Nothing's there. So Solomon is just trying to save us a lot of trouble. Um, so I'm going to make a couple of points here and then we'll close. And these points I'm going to make is basically summing up the book of Ecclesiastes really nicely for us. So like I said, Solomon says that all is vanity, and in a sense that's true. But let's read what God tells us about the vanity and what he thinks about it. Isaiah chapter 45 tells us this. Now, this is Isaiah the prophet, and he's going to introduce God before he tells the people what God said. And in his introduction, he gives God a brief description. Let's see what he says in this, in this description. He says in verse 18, For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. Then he goes on to say what God said. I am the Lord and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. So God is saying, I am not giving you lies, I'm giving you truth. Yes, you've been born into vanity, but that was to turn you back to God, all right? It was so we could see that things aren't adding up, and then we would turn to find truth. And then that's where it says, seeking him is not vain. And that is something that we can do in a vain way world or a seemingly vain world. He commands us to seek him. He commands all creation to seek him. And he says that right there is not vain. Then it says in Isaiah chapter 49, it says, and he said to me, speaking of God, you are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet, all right, so what yet means? Yet actually means at the same time, or these are both simultaneously true. All right, so before we go on to the rest of what he was saying, let's go back to the beginning here. It says that Israel was God's servant and in whom God will be glorified. So if we're grafted into Israel by faith, we now start doing the works that God says is profitable, that is actually meaningful, that isn't vain. So like I said, all this comes, comes by faith. However, Isaiah the prophet says, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for nothing, and in vain. All right, so he's recognizing that the world is vanity, and he lives in it, all right? You, ha you have to work to provide for yourself. You have to do all these things. You have to participate in the economy. You have to do uh, daily work, or everything will just dilapidate and fall apart. So it's not like you can just ignore everything in the world, okay? We're kind of cursed. We're, we're in the curse. We're part of the curse, and there's nothing we can do about that, okay? But who we put our trust and faith in, that is something that can mean something. 
And it does. If you put faith and trust in yourself and what you can do to provide for yourself or try to restore your own soul, which is uh, impossible, uh, it'll end up, you'll end up with nothing. All right, so that is the vanity. So he goes and says he's done all these things. He's labored in vain. Uh, he's been a part of the world because, remember, he's still a sinner. So he says, yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with God, with my God. So do you see what he's saying here? He's saying that the Lord will give him his reward. All right. Then he says, and his work is with God. So he's saying, I'm carrying out what God has uh, told us to carry out, told him to carry out. And that is what faith is, my friends. So, yes, the vanity is there, but so is my redemption. And that's what he's saying. All right. So the first point I want to bring us through, or did, or did I just go through the first point? Yeah, the first point was there was purpose in the vanity. All right, and that's what I just brought you through. Now we're going to go through to our next point, which is remember God. And this is how we're to walk every day of our lives. So what does it mean to remember God? Okay, we're going to go through a couple of Psalms to discover what it means to remember God. Now, right here in Psalm chapter 77, verse 2 through 15, I believe, um, he's going to dis discuss how he remembers God's holiness and righteousness, but also his loving mercy. And you'll see that in here. All right, so he says, In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out. In the night, without ceasing, my soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. All right, so he's thinking about God. That's what that means. He's considering God. This right here is where he was considering God's holiness. And what did it do to his soul? It troubled him. He says, I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. Will the Lord cast off forever? Has his mercy ceased for uh has his mercy ceased forever? Now this is referring to Israel when they weren't uh, meeting God's standards and God basically abandoned them. All right, and this was before the new covenant. All right, so the Holy Spirit was not living inside of men; He was literally at the temple, and uh, He left because they weren't they weren't being obedient. So he says, when he considered those things, he was troubled. And I said that this is my anguish, but I will remember the years of his right hand, the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work. And talk of all your deeds. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have the, you have with your arm redeemed your people. All right, so the first part of this, when he considered the Lord's holiness, it troubled him. But he also considered the loving mercy. All right, so this is all in faith. Do you see that? When you remember and consider God and apply it, this is what happens, all right? And when it talks about his arm redeeming his people, that's talking about God's provision for sacrifice and the forgiveness of sins and the establishment of their feet to be saved. And ultimately, this was the Old Testament saints looking to their salvation, Jesus Christ, which was to come in the future. All right? And God's uh, redemptive works is what he's talking about there at the end. So now we're going to look at Psalm chapter 119, which kind of discusses the same idea. And then it kind of gives us, uh, okay, since I remembered God, this is what uh, is the byproduct of that. 
So in verse 49, it says, Remember the word of your servant, upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for your word has given me life. I remembered your judgments of old, O Lord, and I have comforted myself. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your law. Okay, so if he remembers the name of the Lord, it causes him to uphold the law. So he realizes he's a, he's a, a lawbreaker in the other psalm, but then he also considers that the Lord has provided salvation for his soul. And because of that, out of thankfulness and love, he will uphold what God says is right, and he will not give in to evil. Now, will he fail? Will he do this perfectly? No, not at all. All right, so that is what it means to remember your creator. As Solomon says, remember your creator in the days of your youth, and remember your uh, your creator uh, in in the days that are to come, which is old age. And he's basically saying, have faith in God. That's ultimately what this is talking about. All right, so the next point I'm going to make, and then we'll sum up, we'll make, uh, we'll close this whole thing out. Um, we're going to look at Isaiah 65, and I'm, I've compressed this heavily for the sake of time, but it's talking about the removal of the curse. So we saw in the book of Ecclesiastes what the curse caused as far as us building our houses only for somebody else to live in them. It says a foreigner comes and lives in your house. And then it also says that as we uh, build our bank accounts or gather food, that the foreigner will come and consume all that. All right. And we see that every day in our lives. However, when the curse is lifted, when ultimate restoration of all things comes, and that's something God is going to bring about. Uh, God's promise to restore our true purpose. Uh, life will, for us, have just really begun. So all the vanity in Ecclesiastes will basically be null and void once God's promises take shape. So it says in Isaiah 65, describing the new creation, the new heavens, the new earth, he says this. Verse 17, he says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. So this is a whole new life, totally different from this one. It's really something we can't even comprehend. All right, we can read about it, but reading about something and experiencing something is totally different. A good example is when you have children. When you fir- when you don't have children yet and you think about having kids, you think, oh, I'm going to be the greatest dad ever. But it's totally different when you have the children and you have the responsibilities of the children. Uh, you kind of realize you're going to fall short once you have them. So it kind of changes your perspective. Same thing here. It's like you, we can't understand it until you actually uh, are there. All right, so it goes on to say, But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, the voice of weeping shall no longer be heard. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. All right, and remember, this is the same type of language uh, Ecclesiastes was given us about the curse, that uh, when you try to accumulate things in this world, the devourer will, will basically come and take everything away from you. And the ultimate taking away of everything would be your death. And that's just part of the curse. So in the new world where the curse is not there, these things are reversed. He goes on to say, My elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. They shall not hurt nor destroy 
in all my holy mountain. So this means God is going to bring about ultimate peace, nothing to worry about. And then everything we build and construct and plant, all of that will be no longer vain. And that's just something we can't comprehend. All right, that's ultimate peace, ultimate satisfaction, ultimate everything. <laughs> and uh, it won't be realized till later. And, it, and we have to have faith that it will to be a part of it. Okay, so the ultimate conclusion that I found in the New Testament that basically gives a summation of the entire book of Ecclesiastes within one passage of Scripture, pretty amazing, is found in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 28. So let me read that to you, and then we'll end it there. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs un together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, for we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All right. So I guess we'll end it there. I'm glad you uh, stuck with me through all these books. I know it's been uh, a lot of trudging along. It's wisdom books are difficult. Um, requires a lot of thinking. But I'm glad you came along with me on this journey. And I just pray that all of this that we covered greatly affects you in the most positive way um, that God, God's word is planted deep within your heart and that it will be fruitful. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. So I'm just pray also that you would have a wonderful rest of your week and uh, come back because we'll have more videos on this channel and uh, it's all hopefully to help you grow and know God better. All right, you all have a good rest of your week and we'll see you later. God bless.